Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlen, Vice President of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by uh, Marie Suenema, who is our Vice President of Federal and Enterprise. And we're going to have a conversation today about zero trust architecture, which is certainly topical in the industry today. So I think uh, as much as I, I almost don't want to, but before we get into sort of the, the meat of the conversation, we, we should probably start with just a a brief discussion of what zero trust architecture means. Uh, it seems appropriate, though uh, it would be hard to uh, to miss this topic in the industry today. So, Maurice, why, why don't you start with that, and we'll we'll just sort of talk through what what we think zero trust means. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Happy to. You know, there are several different definitions out there. So this, what I'm, what I perceive, and what you'll hear me repeat is kind of a uh, a glomation or amalgamation of, of some of the key tenets of that. But I think generally it's been described as a, a set of design principles or kind of an overarching uh, strategy for security that uh, really eliminates implicit trust and shifts the burden of uh, assessing, validating a uh, an individual or device's kind of trustworthiness uh, on a per session basis based on what they're trying to accomplish in that moment. There is not an assumption that just because they have uh, logged into a particular enterprise environment with valid credentials that they now can be trusted throughout the entire time that they're in the environment, right? It really segments it down into brief uh, sessions and only focused on whatever specific service or um, kind of target uh, set of data that they're trying to access. And I, I think you, um, it, it's helpful there to to point out maybe the 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 antithesis of zero trust as an illustration of of what it is. This uh, idea that you authenticate and then you're implicitly trusted to all of the the resources, the data, the applications inside some kind of, of perimeter through which that, that authentication gets you. And that that's kind of the way things have, have worked in the past. Um, and Zero Trust presents a, an alternative uh, alternative uh, set of principles, as you said, to that. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. And you you uh, specifically zeroed in on perimeter, which is a great call out, right? I think it Zero Trust acknowledges the reality of uh, far more distributed environments uh, without any sort of kind of defined secure perimeter, and uh, also acknowledges the reality that uh, in many cases attacks, particularly if they are determined attackers that are well resourced and they have a great deal of time, uh, sooner or later may be able to get in. So we assume that we can't just keep them out. Yeah, I think one of the tricky things about this term zero trust architecture is that is that the word architecture, which in a lot of cases, implies a very well-defined, definite object. But as you point out, zero trust is really a set of principles. And in many cases, it's implemented partially in different ways. You know, there are different uh, documents out in the world that describe zero trust in, in um, different terms as well. So it's not that there's a, a perfect ideal of a zero trust architecture. It's more that, uh, you know, we're all, all of the organizations that are trying to achieve some kind of zero trust are, are marching in a general direction based on that set of principles. Yeah, I think that's a great way to describe it. So the, the other topic, moving away from, from that definition of zero trust for a second, the other topic we wanted to introduce in this conversation, um, which really sort of will, will bring us to the point of the discussion, is the term integrity monitoring, um, which is a term that, that's, you know, a big part of Tripwire's history. Uh, but I think, Maurice, you, you often do a great job of, of articulating what integrity monitoring means. Um, so I want to give you a chance to, to sort of put that out in the world here as well. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I think, I think integrity uh, within a context of security can be thought of in two ways. One is uh, a broad organizing concept. 
uh, kind of a mindset, if you will. And then secondly, a set of specific uh, or more specific technical security controls like file integrity monitoring and secure configuration management and so forth. Uh, but I think it's very important to understand first and foremost the uh, the conceptual significance of integrity. So if we think about uh, big concepts in security, right, there are certainly some very familiar ones. So for example, risk management uh, is is understood as a as a discipline, as a approach to mitigating risk by um, acknowledging and trying to anticipate known and unknown risks and and uh, reducing vulnerabilities and so forth. And there are different ways that we have developed to deal with risk. Uh, but another concept is uh, this idea of kind of trying to understand the threat and deal with the threat, right? So threat intelligence uh, is, is one way to try to reduce the uncertainty and increase our knowledge about them so that we can then respond in a uh, kind of a, a targeted or customized fashion to what we understand the threat to be. Uh, and there are other concepts like deterrence, for example, right? Deterrence was the the overarching organizing concept of our kind of strategic um, nuclear deterrence between the two global powers during the Cold War, uh, as an example. So so having, a con- having an understanding of the concept uh, explicitly and implicitly, I think, is very, very important. Uh, and integrity, I and we, I think, would argue, is, is one of those, uh, that fundamentally integrity is about ensuring and maintaining known good states and that it's about ensuring that we are uh, exercising uh, influence and control over ourselves in a way that ensures that regardless of whether we know the threats or not, regardless of whether we're able to reduce all vulnerabilities or not, regardless of whether we're able to affect potential adversary behavior through deterrence, uh, that we can maintain a state of goodness, and that if we do, we've actually accomplished a great deal from a from a security standpoint. So that's a long long winded way of saying that I think that the concept of security as an organizing concept is is very important here. I, I think it's really interesting the way you you describe integrity as as ensuring a a known good state um, because it, it's expansive, right? It, we often we often use integrity, integrity monitoring, and and the file integrity monitoring (FIM), which is sort of a common, uh, well understood capability in the market, interchangeably. But this idea of taking a step back and understanding uh, integrity monitoring or integrity management as maintaining a known good state, it it implies a bunch of other capabilities, really, besides just you know FIM essentially. So you have to first of all know what a good state is. Um, you have to be able to define that. And then uh, that is not necessarily a static entity either. You know, a known good state. Uh, you know, if you put an asset in a known good state, it doesn't it doesn't magically stay in that state. Things change both internally and externally. So that threat environment piece becomes really relevant. The idea that that your uh, the 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 state of your asset may change because of a change in the external threat environment is a a concept that I don't I don't think sort of gets married with integrity monitoring, but it really is part of it when you think about it. Maurice, can you talk a little bit about what you see as the difference between change detection and integrity monitoring? Yeah, certainly. I think change detection is a a kind of a very very specific thing that we do that alerts us to the fact that something has changed, but it provides little to no context as to whether that change is expected or unexpected, authorized or unauthorized, who made the change, and so forth. And so from a security standpoint, it's really the context of that change detection that's very, very important. So uh, if we're talking about FIM, for example, in order to do it well from a security standpoint, we have to both capture all the changes out there, but then deal with the, um, inher- the inherent challenge that arises right away, which is that there is now a great deal of uh, noise, right, or signal that we have to to deal with, and being able to narrow down to focus on those changes that matter is is the challenge. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on site and in the cloud to find 
monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So I want to I want to start trying to sort of stitch these these topics together into you know, a cohesive narrative, if you will. Um, so we talked a little bit about zero trust architecture. We talked about integrity monitoring and the difference between uh, change detection and integrity monitoring and the value of really what I would call the, the context of, a, of, a, of knowing what a trusted state is for a given asset um, in integrity monitoring. And I think we can see how these things are all related, that this idea of understanding what a trusted state is, being able to measure that trusted state um, and monitor it for changes is really a, a concept that's foundational, has to be foundational to, to a, a successful zero trust architecture. Does that make sense to you, Maurice? It absolutely does. And I, and I would take it a step further, actually, and suggest that zero trust uh, assumes that integrity as a broad concept is a key principle in the sense that uh, there is a requirement for continuous revalidation of trustworthiness. So to the extent that, you know, systems are in a trustworthy state and that the human beings connecting into a particular environment or into a session uh, are trustworthy is is essential. And then furthermore, in addition to kind of the, that general concept, there are many other um, security controls that Zero Trust Architecture calls for that in turn need to uh, maintain its own integrity for the whole thing to work. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, and and that that's something that I don't see talked about a lot, which I think is is vitally important. Is how you what what's required to actually maintain the integrity of the 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 architectural components of a zero trust architecture. Um, there's a lot of conversation about uh, you know how do you authenticate successfully? How do you determine the the trustworthiness of a uh, you know, a, a requester, whether it's a, an individual or a device, but how you maintain the trustworthiness of the the systems involved in in the, the architecture itself doesn't seem to be a, a big topic of discussion. It feels to me like it's it's really missing. It, it does seem that way, right? And um, you know, we are uh, and and have been for a long time purveyors of integrity and integrity solutions, right? So I think naturally we're more sensitized to to looking for where integrity shows up or where it may not. But I think it's fair in any sort of objective analysis that in order to trust a device in particular uh, that is connecting into a uh, given system for a particular session, in addition to uh, properly credentialing itself, that the secure state of that device is also a very important factor, right? It may properly authenticate in as a uh, device that has some degree of trust by virtue of it being, say, an enterprise-maintained uh, enterprise-issued device. But do we know that that particular system is actually in a hardened state? Do we know that uh, actions have not been taken on that device, i.e. changes made, that would then uh, take that system either out of compliance with that desired standard or introduce some other uh, new risk or indication of compromise that we would want to know about? So I, I want to introduce a little bit of data into this conversation because I, you're quite right. You know, at Tripwire, we, we, we have a hammer and uh, we're looking for nails. That, that's the reality of, of being a vendor in this space. But there is some some data from a recent survey we conducted uh, that, that talks about um, the relationship between integrity monitoring and zero trust. So there, there are two data points I want to introduce. And of course, people can go look at all the survey data if they'd like. Um, but the two data points I think are relevant to this conversation is uh, first, we asked the question of how important is integrity monitoring to a successful zero trust strategy? Um, and 50% of the respondents said it's foundational. And then 43% said it's somewhat important. And the rest said it's not that important, essentially. Um, and then the second question we asked, which was uh, an interesting one to tack on to that. Um, we had a list of, of statements. Then we asked, which of the following do you consider to be core tenants of zero trust? Now, the, the tricky part about this question is the list of statements are uh, exactly the tenets of zero trust from uh, the NIST definition of zero trust. Uh, so it should be all of them, and all of them was certainly a choice. 
Um, one of those tenants is, uh, quote, the enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all owned and associated assets. And only 22% of the respondents said that they thought that was a core tenant of zero trust. So I was surprised on, on both of these responses. I was surprised that so many people felt it was foundational because I don't see it as part of the conversation today. And then I was also surprised that, that so few people said that that was a core tenant, given that they had just, or well, at least 50% of them, had just said it was uh, foundational. So I, Maurice, what's your reaction to that, that set of data from, from people in the market, from practitioners? You know, that's a tricky one to untangle. I guess I might answer that by, uh, by suggesting that it has to do with the very fact that they're practitioners. And practitioners tend to be people that have a great deal of technical expertise in particular IT functions or security domains. Um, and so uh, they tend to, um, I think, focus on the technical implementation of a particular architecture. Uh, they are looking for specific security controls that have been explicitly outlined. So on one hand, kind of conceptually, you know, they may take that question as kind of an abstract one, right? In the abstract, do you think that integrity is important? And they're going to say yes, because they are familiar with the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, integrity, uh, availability, and so forth. But then as soon as we start asking about, okay, how does this actually get implemented in practice? They think, well, you know, identity and access management, network micro segmentation, and so forth, and may not think about integrity as a more specific control right away. Yeah, that's an interesting point. If we, if we think about how the the concept of integrity monitoring seems you know very reasonable it seems foundational to zero trust as as we talked about but the ability to sort of implement uh is difficult how do we how do we as an industry start to bridge that gap because if we're building zero trust architectures without adequately accounting for something that's foundational to success we're going to see an awful lot of failures ultimately and so what can we as an industry do to, to try and bridge that gap and make integrity monitoring something that people actually see as a as a an implementable strategy, you know, move from strategy to, to tactic maybe? That's a tough question. It's one of those kind of tough questions uh, that persist in our field, right? Kind of like, how do we get users to exercise more secure behavior, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we've known about the problem for decades and we struggle with it and we continue to struggle with it. But I think the answer is similar to the answer for how do we uh, successfully implement, implement foundational controls? So whether we're looking at the CIS controls or we're looking at the NIST cybersecurity framework, any of the kind of commonly accepted um, frameworks for cybersecurity best practices that are built upon a great deal of data and, and expert insight and so forth, so that we can trust that they are legitimate and the data supports that. The challenge is, has not been in getting to the 80%, and, and I don't want to uh, underappreciate the amount of work it can get to it can take to get to 80 percent good but the real battle if you will is in the remaining 20 percent right and when we learn year after year if we look at the Verizon data breach investigations report for example I mean it, the tone and tenor of the report has turned snarky over the years right uh, and they kind of try to make it uh, light and readable to their credit but it's the same old same old in many many cases and so the question is not, is the thing to do magical, unique, difficult? It's how do we do it consistently at scale and reach the parts of the environment that need to be reached? Uh, and integrity is is very much that, right? You can't claim integrity if you're only... You can't, can't claim integrity and character if you're only telling the truth 80% of the time, right? It needs to be pretty close to 100%. I, you know, I'm not sure I agree. That's a tough one because it, it, your your metaphor makes sense to me, except that I, I'm super sensitive to to making the perfect the enemy of the good in these scenarios. It, it's like with, with ransomware, we get ourselves in this position where we implicitly believe that a ransomware attack, a successful ransomware attack is inevitable. And so we stop focusing on preventative controls and we move on to just how do you respond? You got to have backups, you know, don't pay the ransom, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that that you can make incremental improvement in prevention that reduces the chance that you're going to have a successful ransomware attack. And it, it feels to me like integrity monitoring is the, the same thing, that we 
we we aren't looking at the incremental improvement that we could make, even if we can't finish that extra 20%, that last 20%, getting to the 80% is still awfully valuable. Am I, do you think I'm missing something? No, I think that's a great point. And I think there is a... Um... There's a way to arrive at a uh, reconciliation of these concepts. Uh, let me attempt to frame it this way. You know, we, w as Tripwire, we've been in this business a long time, right? And so we have interacted with thousands of, of customers in the federal space and state and local government and large enterprise and small enterprise across a variety of industries. And we often see this tendency toward chasing uh, the newest technology solutions, Right. The, the, and there's a tendency to say, we've been wrestling with the same thing for so long. There's got to be a different tool out there that can maybe make my problems go away. And so as we see, you know, to, to kind of point to Gartner's hype cycle, right? As we see new security technologies climbing up the, the slope, there is an excitement and an anticipation that maybe that can help. But we've also seen in many, many cases where organizations will, uh, suffer a breach and then realize it's not about the shiny new thing. It's about actually extending some basic controls that they may have on their critical systems, but further out. So I wouldn't disagree with um, with what you're suggesting that, you know, a great deal of gain can be made from getting uh, improving from, say, 80 percent to 85 percent or 85 to 90 percent. Uh, typically, there is a trade off for the organization in terms of where they invest their time, efforts and resources between uh, looking for a net new architecture or control or tool versus extending something that is kind of working at 80% uh, or at an 80% level and trying to improve that. And what we can consistently find is that going back to the basics and doing that well is what matters most. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a real challenge. In many cases, it's easier to get funding for, you know, a large new project, potentially a capital expenditure than incremental funding to expand something that, you know, frankly, when it's successful, it 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 isn't top of mind, um, and that that budgeting aspect is something that that we we often forget about when we're looking at the latest greatest technology and getting excited about whatever promises it can make. Um, so uh, you know, this is a a good conversation for us to have. I think we we sort of surfaced integrity monitoring as a, a core component in zero trust. And hopefully it, it spreads a little bit and other people are, are going to have this conversation about how integrity is foundational to successful zero trust. But what, Maurice, what would you like to see change in the industry around this zero trust conversation? Because it, it's a big conversation with the executive order driving it. We're going to see, uh, you know, federal adoption and then kind of the waterfall from that into other commercial spaces. Um, what would you like to see change about that conversation as we move forward? I think one way to um, up-level the conversation is to more explicitly uh, state and underscore the, uh, the underlying assumptions that go into it. We know that um, kind of deny by default, right, or removing implicit trust is a core principle of zero trust. But I think the conversation that that we've had so far kind of helps to elucidate one of the other principles that underlie uh, zero trust as a concept. If we can kind of elucidate that more clearly, then zero trust, uh, I think, can help with security strategy in general. There tends to be kind of a um, uh, bundling together of, uh, when we look at the wording, right, and, and, and we look at the uh, the conversations around zero trust, we tend to bounce between the conceptual and then the much more specific practical security controls. Uh, but being able to much more clearly state here are some building blocks conceptually for zero trust may help clarify a number of things about security strategy in general. So I think that that is one thing that we could do a better job of and hopefully this brief conversation contributes in some way to that. Uh, and then Secondly, of course, continuing the work that's already been begun by NIST and CISA and NSA and so forth to uh, specifically articulate uh, technical controls that should be a part of a zero trust architecture, uh, organizing them into maturity models and so forth are very helpful.
Yeah, I agree. I, I've been I've spent some time on on the draft documents, uh, you know, the maturity model from from CISA and the OMB's draft memorandum. I, I think they're they're interesting. I don't think they're perfect by any means, but they have the, the potential to to really drive material change. Um and that's something that uh you know we shouldn't we shouldn't uh think twice about. I think that's that's highly valuable. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Maurice, I, I want to thank you for, for spending time with us. I think it's an interesting conversation, um, hopefully interesting for everybody who, who uh, has listened as well. There's more to talk about with Zero Trust. It's going to be a, an ongoing conversation in the market, probably not the only podcast we'll do about it, uh, but certainly an interesting one to, to have done uh, for now. So thank you, Maurice. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Great to talk with you today. And thanks, everyone, for listening. And please tune in to the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.